crams, cavorts, gesticulate, stamp, whirl, sweat and laugh with the most obvious enjoyment. So this is the daily worker in terms of what's going on in these places. Not necessarily with, um, with, with, with a sense of disapproval, that's just a description of what's going on there. But then you get these comments on articles like that. Um, dancing at its best is an emotional display and as such is to be deplored. Jitterbugging is really the lowest to which anyone can sink to turn oneself into a slobbering savage, a drooling psychopathic horror, a jerking bundle of sensual emotions is the lowest one can go. Those are attitudes that are sort of actually, they're also deeply rooted in a part of our national culture. I don't know anything at all about the person who wrote that, whether there was, it was to do with, you know, a non-conformist background, whether there were any particular reasons why they should have reacted so strongly. But I think we sometimes sort of think, well, that's yeah. all coming from the USSR or it's all coming from Stanoff. But I think it tapped into something that was already here. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it, it's that kind of paranoia that people might just be enjoying themselves. You know? and, and it's, but I think it is a kind of part of perhaps a wider Marxist or kind of leftist, not really knowing what to do with pleasure as an idea, you know, not kind of being able to fit it into any kind of framework. So that, that part you were quoting from, um, uh, another bit sort of jumped out on me a little bit later on which says that um, dancing is, is, is a rather poor way of consuming surplus energy and quite irrational from the point of view of personal efficiency you know in just that sense that it just 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 pure pleasure has no kind of it can only be a bad thing because it doesn't contribute i remember a good friend of mine a rock a rock guy a, a, drum, a drummer a really good player and he said ron he said the great problem with jazz is he says there's no sex in it, is there? Nobody cares about sex. They don't seem... It seems to be nothing to do with that world. Whereas he says, popular music, it, it's all about sex. And that's why it's popular and why jazz isn't. I'd never thought of that before and I was already 65 or so. <laughs> I'm not sure jazz was perceived that way by some of these um, people that are disapproving of it in the oh, yes. communist circles. Oh, Because that's what they see is you're just letting go to these yeah. unbridled passions. and, and um, mm. But I think, it, I think it's quite interesting the notion of... I mean, this, I think the, the, the quote that you pull out in terms of, you know, it's an irrational way of, of using your surplus mm. energy and so on. I think it is quite telling because I, because I've thought about this quite a lot with people, interviewing lots of of communists and former party members, um, and getting to know some quite well, and actually where sometimes I think sometimes we can actually ourselves be quite prescriptive about when people are actually enjoying themselves. Like you obviously. You know, because I'm part of that culture of a later generation, so you must be enjoying yourself if there's a lot of sound and you're getting quite drunk and that. Mm. And actually, if you're just sat there reading a book, how can you be really enjoying yourself? Yeah. And I'm, I'm convinced of the, from people I know, people who could recite Shelley to me and mm. so on, mm. that this is not a, a sort of denial of themselves, this is an expression of themselves. Mm. But I think there's always a sort of improving aspect to it. Mm. And it always, so it always does link with that sense that um, you've got somewhere at the end of it, you've just not wasted mm. an evening reading Shelley or whatever it might be. Actually, I mean, these, these were real tensions, I think, not between the left and the world beyond necessarily, but really right through the Communist Party. This mate of mine, my closest friend at school, he was much more political than me. His dad, I don't know if he was a Communist Party member, he was certainly a shop steward at Metropolitan Vickers. This mate of mine, Ernie Hall, he said, would you like to come and do, play some records, do a, give a talk to this... Funnily enough, the Labour League of Youth. And they were all infinitely more left-wing than I was. But I, I, just, I could just about make out a case for the old blues guys and the people's music side of it. And that was nothing to do with the Communist Party. That was just this pal of mine who wasn't in the Labour League of Youth saying, oh, you know, why don't you come and... Give, they're always looking for people to give talks, and that was it. And I thought, it's the first time I'd ever... The, the, the two enthusiasms, one current, the other one to develop later, came together. 
at a Labour League of Youth meeting. And I remember when I was writing for the Morning Star, the Anglo-Soviet Cultural Society, or whatever it was then called, organised this little evening with a guy who I got to know quite well, called Miles Kington. Miles Kington was a Times columnist, but he had the jazz spot on the Times. They said it would be quite an interesting idea for you from the communist paper and for him from the Times to chaperone this guy around London and show him the kind of the jazz and what popular music scenes or whatever you can do. He was the editor of a magazine in Moscow called Literary Gazette. We spent the whole evening together and we went to the Marquee Club in Water Street. We went to the 100 Club here on Oxford Street. We didn't get to Ronnie's, but I, I think we went to one other place and we ended up at the Roundhouse. And the Roundhouse was all kind of psychedelic and freaky. And we spent this whole evening with him. And what was interesting was, and the reason I just brought it in, was how much he knew about, not jazz so much, but American popular music, and how much of it was actually played in kind of hotels and nightclubs and so on in the Soviet Union. And he said, oh, it's nothing like you lot think it is. I mean, I'm paraphrasing him. But uh, that was a bit of a, a revelation to me. I mean, I'm not saying that makes it all wonderful, but it was more complicated. I've always been... I suppose we came, I came a communist in the first place because there's a side of him which is quite puritanical and the puritanism m meant that I didn't really embrace the whole notion of underground rock. If you've got this puritanical outlook and jazz is being denounced as being this hedonistic, drug-saturated yes, yes. culture, I mean from official communism, yeah. and actually particularly the modernists, I mean the beboppers weren't yeah. seen as being puritanical at all. So did, was that also a tension that you felt about the way people used to describe the jazz culture? It was located yes, yes. in seamy nightclubs and... The whole normal boundaries of theatre and music um, jazz was always outside that and, I, and my puritanism there w was like focused on the idea that these people were worth more than society actually accords them. Some of the earliest things that I can remember in the 70s like Mike Westbrook yeah. Um, performing at the People's Jubilee, That's which right. was the Communist Party alternative That's to right. the Jubilee in 77. There was a band, uh, one of the first bands I ever saw was called Red Brass, which were people That's like right. Chris Bisco, um, mm. that they, they were, they were yeah. um, a sort of jazz rock thing, but the mm. Red Brass, but they'd got mm. a sort of left lyrics, and it was mm. the, the left lyrics of the time, so it was different in that sense, but it was more yeah. overtly political well, in a way. I mean, Tony Haynes founded Red Brass. We used to be great friends when I was in the union at AMU and, and in a position maybe argue the band's case for, you know, uh, funding, because we had funds to help music with. That was my job, basically. I wasn't there as a journalist. I was there as an administrator of a kind of arts fund. He was the first to jump into the whole multicultural notion of the 70s and, and the 80s. And I mean, even people like Courtney Pine got some of their first jobs in his band. He always had a mix. And, and also he, he would love Indian musicians, Asian musicians. And, he, and, th and that's always been his guide, the guiding philosophy of the thing. But Tony Haynes would never be a communist because it was too late. In terms of reconciling those different elements, there's the, there's a, there's the almost like a kudos of Americanism. There's the interest in the sort of jazz as a black music from below. There's the also there's the sort of the the communism and the official Soviet culture. Yeah. You've not mentioned Paul Robeson, who might be the one figure that might bring those together. Was he a, a big figure for you in the fifties? He was a universal figure. Even my mum and dad loved him. They didn't actually know he was a communist. He just had a fantastic voice. But the one time he made a record with the Count Basie Orchestra, by which time I was left-wing, you felt 
terribly disappointed because it was fairly awful. I mean, he wasn't... He had no jazz time at all. He just didn't have it. I mean, that wasn't what he was about. I mean, he was like a classical bass baritone singer. But he wasn't seen by most people as a communist figure. It was later that I discovered there was a book by Howard Fast, I think, and he was an American communist writer who wrote Spartacus, didn't he? And and I think he wrote this book. It was really like a long pamphlet about Peekskill. And Peekskill, I think, Robeson performed there. And it was a kind of... Where would it be held, Kevin? You, you it's fresher in your mind than mine. Somewhere out on, like, in New England somewhere, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it was obviously a big festival of left. And it was completely smashed up and broken up by American fascists and and anti-communists who, you know, were very dominant at that time, you know. And that marked the end of the American left labour movement, really, that period. And even Robson couldn't, him and the two figures who were kind of major figures that we clung on to as... Well, look, they were on our side with Charlie Chaplin and him. Other people I've spoken to have said, like, for them, them, he was like the symbol of the other America. And because, you know, in a sense, he was was suffering in the McCarthy era and so what on. Robson? Yeah, and he was the he was the symbol of the the alternative America, which, yeah. from it sounds for you, that, that jazz, in a way, was, was partly that. A good friend of mine, who's dead now, was a guy called Frank Howling. I met him down here he sort of sought me out because he read, used to read my stuff in the daily worker or the morning star and we got to know each other and we got to be good friends and he was a, t- a tool maker a fitter he worked in a factory in trafford park and by the time we got to know him his sight was beginning to go and gradually he became blind now the point about frank was that he was one of the most dedicated jazz fans I've ever met. He went to live in America in the mid-50s because of his jazz mania. And whilst he was there, he got to know an awful lot of musicians. And one of the people who he became really friendly with was Dave Brubeck. And when Brubeck used to visit Manchester, he would go and visit him and his funny old Salford mum in their terraced house and he would have tea on a Sunday afternoon. He had a, perhaps a pre-trade hall concert the night before on maybe it was going to be the Sunday night. They were re- became really close friends and he knew a few others like Bill Evans and, and, and quite a lot of New York musicians. Now the point is he became so disenchanted with the American way of life that he decided to come back to England but he came back via the Soviet Union. He made some kind of journey to Australia and across, I don't know, and then he spent some time in the Soviet Union, came back and joined the Communist Party here. He had a kind of like a an incredible sort of road to Damascus type thing. Soviet Union didn't seem to put him off at all. But later, when we used to chat and we'd play records and I'd play some music in the car if we'd been to a gig or whatever, and we'd chat more, he never made any connection at all between his jazz thing and his communism. He went to America because of jazz. He became disenchanted with the whole American ethos. He became a communist but he never made any connection. He never worried about the class struggle, people's music, music of blacks, nothing. He only was interested in the sounds. And yet on his other side of his life, he'd gone to this extreme thing of moving to America and then moving back to join the Communist Party in England. That's an, uh, an interesting tale. It's a pity he's not here to tell it. Nothing fits quite a simple view of relating the music to the politics. The two things were always quite separate to him. There's a guy called Chris Wellard who used to run a record shop in Lewisham. He was a party member and he had a jazz shop. 
lovely bloke. Chris said, come and give a talk. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll talk about Marxism and jazz. That shows how long ago it was. And I really had to go at it. And, and of course, that was full of Archie Shep and Albert Eiler and, and the struggle of blacks and so on. Um, but it was all, that was the only way you could make it work for an audience. I think that I came out of a different era and it was like inevitable that somebody like me would have a different version of what a communist was supposed to do in relation to this music. When I came on the Musicians' Union scene in the mid-60s, I knew about an assistant secretary called Harry Francis. Harry Francis was almost more famous than the general secretary, which was a guy called Hardy Ratcliffe. It was well known that Harry was a Communist Party member. And so before I got there, I thought, oh, here's a Communist star at the top of the organisation. That would be really useful. But when I got there, and also I'd seen him once when I was on one of my morning star joints reviewing. I went back up to Manchester. There was a big jazz festival at Bellevue and Dizzy Gillespie was on the bill. But at a particular time, I was just watching, I've been a coffee or a cup of tea or something, and Dizzy walked up to Harry Francis and gave him a huge bear hug. And it was at the time when Dizzy was kind of... You know, he, he was not afraid to go to Cuba and he was playing Afro-Cuban music and all that kind of thing. And I thought, wow, you know, Harry Francis, he knows who he is and so on and so forth. He was always going on about this Czech big band read, led by a guy called Gustav Brom. And Gustav Brom was better than Count Basie because he was from Czechoslovakia. <laughs> You know, it was a proper communist band. When I started thinking about researching the links between jazz and left, which I was doing as a historian of the CP, but also, just as you're describing, with, you know, could you bring music and politics together, also as a jazz enthusiast, I'd always known about this left-wing milieu from the late 40s onwards, oh. which was people like Sidney Fil Finkelstein, it was people like Eric Hobsbawm, oh. It was jazz as a people's music, um, and it was a sort of, almost like an alternative cultural respectability, because it wasn't just like pop music, it wasn't commercialized, but it wasn't like concert halls and straight orchestras. Oh. So you were, you, you were challenging the establishment, but at the same time, it, you know, it had its own respectability. So I, so I knew about, you know, and things like the 100 Club, we have a famous institution not far from here, um, I knew that there'd been benefits played there, and by this time it no, they'd gone into the sort of punk scene, and it was a well-known venue, but it started off as a jazz venue. I'd known about the musicians that had played and the older master and marches, and the links between politics and protest. But then, so and the musicians union didn't enter into that at all. It was just actually a, a rather negative influence because it's main you're mainly associated with it having stopped top jazz musicians coming over from the states to play here for donkey's years, which wasn't the case by the seventies, but that's what you'd heard of in the fifties and such. And then actually doing the research, which is what really links in with what you were saying about the role of the MU to suddenly find there was this whole layer of musicians, union activists in the 1930s that I'd known nothing about, many of whom were communists. That was certainly the focal point of their activities. And actually the way I found out about them initially was going to work in the Mass Observation Archive. And then just coming across, they'd got this um, topic collection on, on dance bands. The main researcher was Hugh Clegg, who later becomes like the most eminent industrial relations specialist effectively you have in this country, an Oxford academic. But the young Hugh Clegg was a communist at that time, but he was working for mass observation. And he was going around speaking to the musicians in West End dance bands 
again, not far from here, you'd got Archer Street where the musicians were congregating two or three hundred during the daytime, waiting for whatever that work they could get that week or that night, going around doing the typical mass observation interviews with them and finding out how political they were. It was the time of Spain, the time of Popular Front. It all focused on rebuilding the union. And these were top dance band musicians playing in top orchestras at the time. But in just the way you're describing, it had nothing really to do with the music at all, their politicisation. It was they, first of all, as workers who were, in a sense, they were organising to better their living standards or to get better security and so on, combined with the fact that in many cases they'd come from they were coming from sort of poor East London backgrounds. They were they were traveling to these swanky West End night spots. Absolutely sort of every, you know, each evening that you you went to work there, it was sort of renewed your sense of antagonism towards a class system whereby you and your type lived here and there were this lot living in, the, in, in uh, or, or spending their evenings at least in these conditions of opulence. And so that's the way I got into it actually. And there, there was... Um, I think you mentioned Billy Amstel. He was, you know, some of these people still about. He was performing in the top. Geraldo Orchestra was well, yeah, probably in, the in top. Ambrose, Ambrose, Ambrose beg your pardon, Ambrose, top British band. And he was a good time. saxophonist as well. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. But he he'd not been a communist, but he'd been part of that milieu. And he was telling me that yeah. he respected the communists as union organisers. Mm. Um, there was, there was Douglas Hyde, who I, I knew at that time, who would be, was famous for his account, I believed, his story of his disillusionment in communism, which was an international bestseller in the Cold War. One of the things that he told me was how he would be giving these classes on Marxist education to musicians, union activists, and there were fractions, Ivor Morantz, um, the, uh, Ambrose, Geraldo, yes. different orchestras, people like Van Phillips. So there was this whole world which actually I had known nothing about because if you look at the, the histories of jazz or of popular music, they don't mention the political aspects at all because it wasn't really bound up with the music. It was more to do with the conditions of work right. and the conditions um, of life. So in that sense, I think there always, that, that sort of tension you're describing, I think there always were these, almost like two cultures. Because actually, when you started to get the jazz enthusiasts of the type who are sitting down listening very earnestly to Jelly Roll Morton records, which is, mm. um, uh, 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 you know, the sort of the tradition that then carries on for decades, and the, 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 the music on which it focuses changes, but that becomes that sort of jazz appreciation. Um, well, that lot, they didn't really get on with the musicians because they weren't interested in this sort of synthetic. Um, British das dance bands and, and um, the, the swing type numbers, they were interested in the pure music of revolt and alternative folk culture, uncontaminated by capitalism and, and so on. And there were, there were fantastic descriptions you can find um, in, the, in the late 40s where they're, they're, they're having the, um, they have these sort of, they're collectors really, they collect records. And that's what they want. They want to hear this proper jazz, but which in a sort of, there's a, this irony that they only ever hear it as performed on records. So it's, it's a sort of folk music that never actually exists in terms of real people performing. And they'll listen to this for an hour of recital with somebody talking through in just the way you're describing. Then they'll have an interval. They'll all clear off to the bar while then there's suddenly these swing type musicians will start playing for 20 minutes, do their bit, and then they'll only come back after they've finished playing and get back to the proper, pure mm, American right. yeah. Negro jazz in terms of what you were saying. So maybe that tension you're talking about goes back, you know, a long way, basically. I think jazz, I mean, I think jazz in that period, there was this, there was this more... They were like the jazz aficionado thought was jazz, which was a much more purist definition, which oh, could yeah. even exclude. I mean, there were, there were famously, you talk about actually the, if, if the saxophone was disapproved of under Stanoff in the USSR, the saxophone was also disapproved of by jazz purists. There was this famous mm -hmm. uh, character who wrote, um, he, he, was, he, he was part of that milieu, he wasn't a communist, but a man called Rex Harris, 
but he he famously or notoriously says that one of the leading jazz saxophonists with which was Coleman Hawkins could have been a fine musician had he not played the saxophone because the <laughs> yeah. saxophone meant it was that broader world which everyone else thought of was jazz which was commercial light music of a certain type and I think actually the interesting thing about some of these dance band musicians in a way is there were different musical personalities there, sometimes trying to find expression. There were two names I came across. This is in, in the early part of the war. These were communist supporting, if not actually communist dance band leaders who did benefits for the People's Convention. The People's Convention was like a mobilization of popular opinion around the communist demands of the day. And one of them, um, one is just quite interesting in passing because that was Phil Cardew because that's the father of Cornelius Cardew and there's that sort of generational link to another type of leftist movement which is a sort of more avant-gardist in the 60s. So that's just sort of quite interesting incidentally. And the other was a, was a man called uh, Ben Frankel mm. who is, um, I mean he certainly is a, a, a communist because he, he leaves over in protest against Stalinism basically in the early 50s, but he's also, I think, been performing as a dance band leader, but has serious pretensions as a composer, and in fact becomes a highly, you know, resp a reputable composer um, in, in sort of actually a quite a modernist sort of post Schoenberg type of um, musical language, as Benjamin Frankel, but this Ben Frankel at the time of the People's mm. Convention. You know, I suppose that's just what you did. You know, it, it was again; it was a way of making a making a um, a living. So I think there are these these split personalities. It's interesting what you're saying about um, the sort of privileging of the record over the live performance, which is it's interesting because in certainly in communism, uh, in sort of literary culture and in, in around the popular front in the 30s, there's, there's a lot of interest in performance and you know, kind of. Um, a sense that, yeah, of kind of various kinds of oral traditions like the pageants and, and all that kind of thing and mass declamation and that kind of idea of wanting these sort of event type things. It's very interesting that what you're saying is that the opposite seems to have taken place in music, that, that those um, there was less interest in live music and more interest in sort of kind of sitting around and listening to records. I think that's true, but I should make a big caveat with, with that because um, there, was, there was this focus on, there's this recorded music mm. which has the authenticity of its origins, basically, mm -hmm. um, which, which was often music by um, musicians, say, of the 1920s and 30s, oh, okay, who you weren't going to see live anywhere mm. in the States. This was this was a, a sort of musical form mm. that had, had now had its day because you you hadn't really got New Orleans music at that point where you've get the this is we're talking about late 30s, early 40s, where you start to get these jazz collectors first emerging. So the only mm. form in which that music really exists mm. is as these shellac records yeah. that they play to each other. But I should have really made the, the caveat clearer that there, is, there are these younger working class lads, because they are all male, um, who are then inspired to have a go of themselves, just as you were describing. You know, you actually, you're inspired by this music, so you want to see if you can play this music. Mm -hmm. um, and it's down in, in South East London. These are basically industrial workers who the, the Challenge Jazz Club, mm. um, that is the George Webb Dixielanders, is the band that comes out of the, of the Challenge Jazz Club. And you probably wouldn't listen to them now on purely aesthetic grounds, but on sociological grounds, mm. you might, because this, is, this was a sense that they were really trying to imitate this music and replicate it. So that in this strange way, this music they saw as this authentic indigenous American people's music would also be their authentic indigenous people's music. Yeah. Um, and actually, one of the people I interviewed was a man called Owen Bryce, who was the cornetist, I think, which I think he played cornet, which Owen, is another sign of a sign of, of, of sort of purism in a way, because mm. Louis Armstrong had initially played the I cornet think before died, the trumpet. Owen. Yeah, well, he he was, but he was the person who actually was 
he he had been in the George Webb's Dixielanders and I think was sort of moved aside for the young Humphrey Littleton, who is a much more talented. I mean, he mm. would have Owen would have acknowledged that a much more gifted trumpeter. And then, in a sense, George Webb Dixielanders it becomes the Humphrey Littleton band or you know and eventually he becomes the star and that's leading through to the bad penny blues and getting into the charts and yeah, so on yeah. but it all starts with this it's almost like you know it's, it's young working class enthusiasts for jazz mm. and they're purists they don't want mm. the music you hear on the bbc but it, it changed in a way quite quickly because he died about two years ago now, three years ago. I became very close, very friendly with a guy called Eddie Harvey. Mm -hmm. Eddie was, in the end, almost like a one-man history of British jazz because he was in that George Webb band. But he told me that... Uh, he's mentioned, actually, in your chapter. Uh, he told me that what he was, he, was in, he was a draftsman in whatever was the big factory near Woolwich Arsenal. And he said, like, it, we said we all spent our time, well, not all, but some of us, writing scores at work and going to see Charlie over there who was, in, who was in another dance band and swapping ideas for writing arrangements of popular music and so on. And this was whilst he was still in yeah. the acme of purism, which was the George Webb band. And, of course, it, funnily enough, when he went from that... To become the trombone player in the Johnny Dank with Seven, that was like heresy, you know. How yeah. could you leave this pure music to join a glorified dance band? And yet Johnny Dank with Seven was the epitome of the new sophistication. And with Cleo Lane singing, made it just about a proposition. And also Dankmuth was much more intelligent than most band leaders. He was able to plot a course and he was also more talented. And there's another element that you, you didn't quite bring out. That business about the Billy Amstels and all those guys in the, the Mayfair world of the hotel and so on, there was a secondary hatred or maybe a primary hatred it wasn't just of the tops, because to be fair, those people in those bands were also driving off home after the gig in big cars. They were making a lot of money themselves by the standards of the time. But their real hate figures were the band leaders, because the band leaders were mostly without any talent whatsoever, except as businessmen organizing work. And that's why they were tolerated. They could organise work, and so we got work. But their actual musical knowledge or musical philosophies were, to them were, were, were kind of like, they were like morons, they were Philistines. So they had a thing, they hated the audience, mm -hmm. <laughs> they hated the band leader. Mm -hmm. It's quite rich ground for actually becoming a disgruntled left-winger, isn't it, really? Yeah, no. <laughs> It's interesting what you say about Eddie Harvey because people, was it Owen? Somebody certainly mentioned this sense because so he is one of this, you know, this, this, we're going to re recreate this pure sort of almost proletarian folk music and then he's defecting to the modernists. Yeah. And it was almost, um, I don't know if it's in the chapter there, referred to these kangaroo courts, but it's a bit like Bob Dylan right, going yes, electric yes. in the 60s, that actually, how could you have betrayed mm. having been one of us? And, and That's uh, right. Um, mm. Which partly shows you, actually, you know, in a sense that I think probably more so in that period than afterwards, one sort of common feature between jazz and the left is people seem to share quite a similar perspective and to everybody else they all look the same mm -hmm. and yet they're intensely factionalized amongst yes. each other and always falling out and drafting manifesto and counter manifesto and even like the jazz periodicals that the first jazz magazines which were real labors of love um, in the 1940s um, and i suppose they would have been the sorts of things that your gary Hobsbawm would have subscribed to with the jazz sociological